Good morning. I'm finishing up the uh, discussion on the, the Lagrangian problems that I was doing. And I'll just show you the method of, uh, well, at least I'll start possibly Hamiltonian mechanics, a slightly different approach. Now, uh, we were finishing up a problem the last day. I have shown you the essence of setting up a Lagrangian, applying Lagrange's equation, and getting the equations of motion, okay? Now, I did it for a couple of masses and a pendulum. It doesn't matter. It's the same for all the other problems. The only thing is, it can get more complicated. For example, I might do this problem. This is a standard problem. Or this one. Now, it's easier when the masses are equal. Unequal mass becomes quite difficult. Um, the same approach applies. It just gets longer. It means your hands get tired of setting up more equations. For this one here, uh, you're going to have two degrees of freedom. This one here. And this one here. But you're going to have cross terms. So it might be best to work out the x and the y coordinates of the particle and then take the derivatives for the speed. I'll have a look at that one. Actually, if I have time, I'll do both of these problems for one class. Now today, here's what we had the last day. We applied the Grange's equations to the case of a particle moving in a paraboloid. Um, where is it? R squared equals a z. So therefore then one over z is one over r squared, one over a times r squared. It's a paraboloid, and we centered it on the origin. Okay? Now you could have a defined height h. So we got these three equations which contained a Lagrange multiplier. We got this equation. This is a statement of the conservation of angular momentum. It's a conservative system. Now, of course, there will be no motion at all if we don't have enough kinetic energy. If we don't have enough kinetic energy, the thing will stay down at the bottom somehow. So you need enough kinetic energy to elevate the sides and increase the z. The Lagrange multiplier appears, appears here and here. So you need to find it. Now, I can't remember if it's a positive or a negative sign. It's a negative sign somewhere. All right. Before you can proceed, you need boundary conditions. So I'm stopping the problem right here because I don't know what kind of boundary conditions we can evoke. An example of a boundary condition would be uh, let the particle travel at a height z equals h, in which case the z by dt is 0, d squared z by dt squared is 0. So we can solve for that lambda. mg is minus lambda times a, or lambda is minus mg over a. So lambda begins to take on some significance. Actually, it's a generalized force. That's really what the lambda is. So that's what we had for that particular problem. Now the other problem that we looked at, so let's get your head around that. I'll clean it. Once you get used to setting up the Grandians, applying the equation becomes second nature and you can do the longest problem you can imagine. The procedure is all the same. Now, one of the problems we looked at was this one. I think I had one mass, I can't remember. No, two masses. And we have to find the potential energy. It becomes clearer when you label the spring constants with different numbers. I'll do it this way. You get a calf kx squared for that one. If x1 is the displacement. And a half kx3 squared for that one. And now we look at the potential energy in this spring. Well, it's going to be a difference. I forget which way I did it. Um, something like that. How many, 
I can't remember how many uh, masses I had on that. Was it one, two, or three? I'd have to go back and look at my notes. One way or another, this one is going to be a difference, and you square it, and it doesn't matter if you go x3 minus x2, because when you square that, they're both equal, right? Basically, that was the problem anyway. <clears throat> let's look at something slow. Oh, let's do, uh, what can we do next? Okay, to solve the Kepler problem. The Kepler problem is the problem involving planetary orbits. Okay, so what does the problem look like? Well, the gravitational potential is minus gm over r. We'll just call it k over r. Okay. I think there's another n in here. That's the, that's the potential. k over r. So the t is going to be 1 over 2 m b squared minus k over r. And that's going to be 1 over 2 m r dot squared plus r squared e to the dot squared plus r squared sine squared theta phi dot squared minus k over r. And then you just apply Lagrange's equations as before. Now what's going to happen is that mo the motion is going to be confined to a plane, so this part is zero. So really you're going to be left with just these two components of velocity and this guy here. And then you will get an awkward set of equations, which is best solved using Hamiltonian's methods. So we'll have a look at Hamiltonian methods now, very briefly. You'll see uh, a different approach to mechanics. I'll just remind myself what I'm going to do. Now we're going to look at the generalized momenta. Um, the L over the QI dot are called the generalized momenta. Now the Hamiltonian Find as sigma pi qi dot minus l summed over i for i equals 1, 2, 3, depending on the number of degrees of freedom, the generalized coordinate for each degree of freedom. Now, I never use this symbol. I use the Einstein summation convention. And that is, when you see an index which is repeated, in other words, here's twice, that automatically sums over that. You can go back and look at some of my general relativity notes to see that. It's a great convention, the summation convention of Einstein. Einstein thinks it's one of his great discoveries, actually, that that little thing works. So the Hamiltonian is given by PIQI dot minus L. So we do a simple example. Oh, wait, first of all, we write down Hamilton's equations. So they're Hamilton's equations. And the Hamiltonian, H, I will just write here because I want to erase the board to save space. Now, that's all there is to 
Hamiltonian mechanics, the essence of it, believe it or not. People say a lot more about it. They talk about, you know, setting up the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. That's a totally separate method altogether. Hamilton-Jacobi is a very sophisticated approach to mechanics, but it's not. The, it's a different one. These are dots. Okay. So we consider the one-dimensional oscillator. And that's what it looks like. Negative of the potential is negative is positive half k x squared. So let's see what the generalized momenta are. Well, in this case, it's just dl by dx dot. So here it is here. And we expected that. The momentum is just mass times velocity. So H is going to be P I Q I dot minus L. Well, I is only one, it's only the X. So it's going to be M V P. Um, now minus the Lagrangian is going to be negative this one. So we have mx dot squared into 1 minus a half, factor of minus a half here. So we get kinetic plus potential energy. So this gives us an insight as to what the Hamiltonian actually is. H is T plus V, and we know that to be the energy. So the energy operator is the Hamiltonian. And that's why it crops up in quantum mechanics, this Hamiltonian, in a very useful way. So what's P dot? Now, negative the H by the QI uh, is going to be negative the H by the, this one here. So the h by the qi is kx. And the qi dot is the h by the pi. Now this is pi here. There's the p. Take its derivative. Yes, that's what it is. So what do we have? Pi dot is a half x dot. I shouldn't be in there with a, a factor of a half. I don't know why I'm doing this. Okay, so I'll correct in the next lesson. Next lesson I'll correct that when I see something funny going on and I also get a come to an abrupt stop if I see I'm missing a sign somewhere. And that's what's happened here. But anyway, I've run out of time. <clears throat>